and welcome everybody who's called in to learn about the spotted lanternfly, a new introduction into Virginia. Um, so quick introductions, uh, you've already heard from Mark, and now we also in the room we have Teresa Bellinger, who works in the Insect Identification Lab, and Doug Pfeiffer, our Extension Fruit Specialist. So we'll start out with my presentation first, and then we'll do a handoff, and um, Doug will do his presentation. So with that, we will launch into the slides here right away. Okay, so uh, spotted lanternfly is now in Virginia as of January 10th, 2018. Um, and those of you who have been following this insect um, have probably been seeing the records of it showing up in southeast Pennsylvania. We'll talk about that coming up a little bit later on. Let me first kind of zero in first on the Virginia detection and also some characteristics of the insect that helps you to identify it as well. So Frederick County, Virginia, about a one mile, one mile square area now um, is the area that's currently infested with spotted lanternfly. Predominantly shows up on Tree of Heaven, and we'll talk about that more coming up as well too. At this time, no pest damage yet in Virginia, although in, in Pennsylvania, it's a little bit different story. This is, again, approximate infestation. So this is a map showing Winchester, Virginia. You can see I-81 is that line that runs north-south. Um, and then this approximately the northern section of Winchester is the area where the spotted lanternfly infestation occurs. So um, this is a very distinctive insect. Uh, I think some of the first comments are it looks like a very pretty moth, it looks tropical. And uh, so this is actually a type of a plant hopper, and we'll talk about that more coming up as well, too. Uh, these, these photographs is of a couple individuals there. The top left and right are individuals with their wings spread open. So you can see the hind wings with the red and black coloration, as well as the abdomen, which has the uh, yellow exposed. So those are some of the characteristics of the adult, if you have ones with the wings spread out. Usually there in that bottom center, is what you're gonna see um, when they're on the bark. Uh, and these are the adults that would be out typically in late fall. Uh, and I'll show you a life cycle uh, coming up in another slide. About an inch and a half long. So this is the stage that you would find them in now uh, if you were out looking. And this is, I mentioned earlier is on Tree of Heaven. This is actually, uh, uh, those that know your bark, this is an elm tree. It shows a couple egg masses. These egg masses are about an inch and a half long. And these would be, kind of the mid-winter look to them. Initially, they start out very shiny. Later on, they kind of get a bit of a dull appearance to them. And they can usually be at the base of the tree, although these branches are from higher up on the tree, um, up in the canopy. So, uh, but they can be found on the base of the tree, as well as virtually any smooth surface nearby. So it'll be on rocks um, and on other things, even uh, man-made objects. So that's, we'll talk about that as far as its spread. Okay, so another shot of the eggs here. Um, these eggs have been a, have had a bit of weathering, so you can see some of the covering that's placed on by the insect has weathered away, and you can see the eggs in these rows, uh, and the uh, these eggs are are unhatched. They're they're the, in, the insects are still inside. If they were hatched, you would see little exit holes on them. Again, the eggs are about an inch and a half long. Egg masses. Uh, the eggs hatch in uh, in Pennsylvania in late April. Uh, we don't know if that will be the exact case in Virginia. We suspect they'll hatch a little bit earlier. Uh, initially, and I don't have a picture of the of the nymphs when they first emerge, they are a black and white pattern, uh, similar in shape to these nymphs here. Uh, but this, these are later nymphs, as you would find in June into July where they start to develop this red coloration. And this picture is taken on a lanthus. So the lanthus has a lot of stump sprouts. This is on a stump sprout on a lanthus uh, in Pennsylvania in the infested area. This is the life cycle here. So uh, if you start um, there in the, in the, uh, sort of the top uh, left, you see adults August through December. And the adults are still there. They have all passed away, but if you have an infested site, you'll often find a dead adults there in the winter. Um, the egg laying was in the fall, September through November. The eggs are present October through June, and the hatch starts um, in May, 
we think maybe it might be late April in Virginia. You can see that's the first instar nymphs, and there's that black and white coloration, the black with the white dots, um, and it keeps that coloration until about July, and then the nymphs start to appear that have that red mark. They molt in, in July, and then you get in August, starting in August, roughly, you'll start seeing the adults, and the adults have that, that spotted appearance on their wings. So uh, what to do, um, what to look for, uh, look for uh, check on a lampus or tree of heaven, um, and that's, uh, a tree is often found on disturbed sites along railroads, um, industrial sites, uh, along highways. It's a very common tree in Virginia. Uh, look for sooty mold and a vinegar smell, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit coming up. The, this insect produces honeydew, which is forcibly ejected from them, and then it lands on branches, trunk, anything underneath the tree, uh, the sooty mold, is, I mean, sorry, the, the honeydew is initially clear, and you get a black sooty mold growing on it. So the sooty mold is, is important for identifying or finding infestation sites. Because a huge amount of honeydew produced, um, it tends to ferment in the soil, so there's often a vinegar smell associated with spotted lanternfly. So you check the spotted lanternfly at the base of the tree, check for egg masses on the, on the bark. We're asking people to report, uh, or citizens to report sightings or suspected sightings of spotted lanternfly to Virginia Tech, to Extension Office, to the Virginia Department of Agriculture, or VDACs, or the Virginia Department of Forestry. All right, uh, this uh, is an insect that has, has some similarities with gypsy moth in that the spotted lanternfly will lay its eggs on a lot of smooth structures, not just the bark where we typically find them, but also on things like park benches, trailers, cars, dog houses, which is exactly the scenario we ran through with gypsy moths. The adults will fly and land on things nearby. There's a one picture there. The top left picture shows it on a, a Department of Agriculture car in Pennsylvania. So um, they can be moved around uh, fairly easily and probably is involved with a lot of their um, the spread of the infestation. All right, um, and just kind of this picture here, the one on the, on the left, it is, that's along I-80, near I-81, near a truck stop, is a tree of heaven. Um, so these are the kinds of places that you can find spotted lanternfly. And so at this point, the plan is uh, that the USDA will be treating all tree of heavens in the Winchester area that's generally infested and about a quarter mile out from them. So they're actively doing eradication um, on the, in that area as well as the Virginia Department of Agriculture too. So, uh, but we've seen from Pennsylvania that eradicating it is very hard. So, uh, but there is an active eradication and there will be eventually a quarantine in that area. Um, and we don't have the details on that yet at this time. Uh, a couple things in the works. Uh, I've just been in contact with the printers. We're gonna have a plastic identification card that's gonna be available um, real soon. Uh, so that's, it's, we're working on that as quick as we can. Uh, they're also known as the scraper cards. Um, and so these things not only can be used to identify the spotted lanternfly, but also can be used to scrape the egg masses off of uh, structures that you find them on. Some existing material, there's, uh, you can search this spotted lanternfly, Virginia, the couple pages will come up uh, for this. Uh, there's a, a number of things on there. One is a link to a couple fact sheets there. One is a spotted lanternfly fact sheet, uh, very detailed, um, has a lot of information on identification, biology, life cycle. In other words, just a more generalized pest alert um, and with more descriptions of, for identifying it. In addition, there's a link to an Ask the Expert page that's specific for reporting spotted lanternfly. So right now, this is a portal that we have for reporting um, what you think might be spotted lanternfly, and we're hoping that people are including images as well as their exact location on there. Please do visit this portal. Of course, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to email me about it, and uh, we can either send you material or, or connect you to things. And at this point, um, I'll fin I'm finishing my comments, and I'll turn it over to Doug Pfeiffer to give his presentation. And good morning, everybody. This uh in continuation of our series of spotted lanternfly talks, this is a, a similar to a talk I gave at our orchard fruit schools this this uh, last month in February, and also the the vineyards association. So uh, it's one that we're really trying to get the word out. Here you see the adult 
with the wings closed, uh, as uh, Eric said, you know, the wings are closed tent like over the body when, it, when at rest. Uh, this is a pest we've been expecting for a while. It was introduced into eastern Pennsylvania in Berks County in 2014. And uh, although there's been an eradication program there, it uh, it's, hasn't been successful in eradicating it, but th there's been some success in dramatically lowering local populations. And so that's something we have to keep in mind in the, the Virginia infestation. So uh, showing how the infestation progressed in 2015, uh, we had three additional counties. In 2016, uh, another couple. In 2017, in Pennsylvania, it went from six counties to 13 counties. So it's been growing every year in Pennsylvania. Also in 2017, uh, it was found in single counties in New York and Delaware and a single county, as you've seen, in, in, uh, uh, in um, Virginia, uh, Frederick County, the Winchester area. Now, this looks like a spotty distribution, and we just don't have enough information yet to really evaluate this. Is, is the distribution really this spotty, or is it the, they're, they're just undetected infestations in the midst? It could be either one. Uh, the, the Frederick County infestation was right next to Interstate Highway and right next to a trail line. In fact, eggs were found along the trail bed, the trees growing along the, the, the rail bed. So we don't really have a, a great understanding of the, the distribution. That's why we really want to get information out on the link to uh, the, the reporting portal that Eric set up. In, in Pennsylvania, uh, there have been several eradication tools, tree banding, as you see here, and that will be uh, used in, in Virginia as well. Egg scraping, or physically removing of eggs. Tree of heaven removal. Uh, the, as you'll see later in this talk, the, the insects come back to Tree of Heaven in, in the, uh, the late summer uh, for uh, adult feeding. And uh, if, if we remove, uh, okay, if we remove the Tree of Heaven, most of the Tree of Heaven on a property, and uh, leave some, a few, which are then treated with insecticide, that is a trap cropping. Uh, approach that has been uh, pretty successful in reducing populations, and then using insecticide to, to protect uh, crops. Uh, he, Tree of Heaven is a preferred host, it's, uh, especially late in the season, but it has really, uh, you know, the, the host list is quite a bit bigger than this, it's at least 60 species, and some of these are, are uh, economically important hosts as you'll see coming up. But you see on this uh, short list right here, that the host plants are very distantly related. It will feed on almost anything. In fact, it's been showing up in some vegetable plantings in, in Pennsylvania as well. Now, what I've done is I've taken the host list that was reported in a, a Journal of IPM article uh, and split it into three slides. So you'll see that the, the, the landerfly occurs on a wide range of hosts. The, the plants in yellow are the ones where uh, adults were collected. The rest are nymphal uh, collections. So you see the nymphal host range is actually very wide. On, here, on this apple we see uh, maple, we see uh, birch, we see walnut uh, down here. That's where adults were picked up as well. Magnolia. The coming slide, we see a couple of adult hosts here, but a wide range of nymphal hosts including um, apple, uh, peach, cherry, uh, rose, multiflora rose, a lot of rosaceous uh, trees are, are fed on by spotted lanternfly. And the final slide here, we see a lot more dull collections, and here's where we see Tree of Heaven, uh, Ailanthus. And so that, that is apparently a required host for the normal development. It's, it's up in the air now whether it can survive and reproduce without having fed on Ailanthus, but it needs Tree of Heaven to acquire the defensive chemicals that it passes on to the, the young. Also here, we see uh, grapevines, wild grapevines as well as Vitus vinifera. And this is expected to be the crop that's at, at greatest risk, although it can uh, pose problems in peach, uh, which it has in Korea, uh, as well as apple. And in fact, in China, it was, in the 1940s, it was reported to be the most severe uh, forest pest in the, the northwestern part. Uh, distribution, short range uh, distribution is by a flight, hopping, walking, uh, it's not going to get very far that way. But the, the real concern is human movement of infested commodities but via the egg masses, uh, as, as Eric mentioned. And one comment was made from Pennsylvania that they apparently like rusty metal surfaces to, 
to uh, lay their eggs on. So you can imagine what could happen if a, a, a train, you know, sits idle for hours or, or days on a, a rail line in the midst of a, a, an overposition period. Uh, these, uh, this is a, an adult that was found in the, in the Winchester visit in, uh, in January. Uh, this is one of several, uh, well, actually quite a few dead adults we found, but we also found the viable egg masses. These are three different shots of egg masses. And sometimes they stand out, sometimes they're very cryptic. The, this egg mass here it doesn't jump out at you. Well, you, know, you had to be looking for them to, to find that. Here's one that's uh, pretty weathered. You can see the, the eggs, egg lines uh, th through that uh, what covering is left. In this slide, the eggs are totally exposed. And when they're totally exposed, you can see the surface of the egg has a, a fluted appearance with ridges and, and valleys along the egg. This is a trellis post in a vineyard in Pennsylvania. So even though the nymphs can't fly, they certainly don't have very long to walk before they can get to uh, uh, preferred host plants. And here we see the newly hatched first instars uh, next to the, uh, the eggs. The eggs hatch in uh, April and May, as, as, uh, as Eric said, on, feeding on a wide variety of plants, uh, pr producing large amounts of honeydew, and you'll see the honeydew production coming up. The nymphs and the adults make large feeding aggregations. They'll jostle for uh, uh, position, uh, but it's best to look for them in the, the evening or at night. Uh, at, uh, in the daytime, they may be hiding down in, in the ground cover. Now, it's normal for the nymphs to fall out of the trees a lot when they're very young. Uh, their, their feet aren't very well developed yet. And that will be important in mechanical control, as you'll see coming on. They fall out of the tree, and they have to climb back up the trunk in order to get back up into a, a feeding area. This graph is a little complex, so I'll walk you through it. The easiest part to, to see and understand, the simplest part is, the, the t table on the bottom showing when the different life stages are present. One generation, uh, eggs uh, through April or May, and that has to be worked out for Virginia. We have no experience with that yet in, in this state. The, the, the four nymphal instars progressively later in the season, adults showing up in June, uh, I'm sorry, in, in July, and feeding uh, and laying eggs through um, the, the fall. The, the eggs showing up really in, in September. So there's a long period of egg deposition. The, uh, the line shows the, the host range. You know, it feeds on the most hosts early in development, and as they mature, the host range declines. So they come back to uh, Atlantis, Tree of Heaven, and, and also grapevines. The rectangle, the polygons here are showing the duration they stay in the plant before falling out. So as they mature, the duration they stay up in the tree gets longer. So again, large feeding aggregations, and you'll see these. These are shots from Pennsylvania, uh, an apple branch nearing harvest, and a, a grape cordon uh, also approaching harvest with what, these feeding aggregations. And you know, some trees may be worse than others, but you know, this general appearance was widespread through these plantings. Now this is, well, we'll turn to a video. This is, shows the adults, and you can see the, um, the short fluttering flight that, that they'll make. So there'll be one that'll be photobombing us in a few seconds here, but you can see the, the fluttering flight that they make. They'll climb to a, a high position and then fly. There we go, there's a photobomb. You know, they'll climb to a high position and then fly. They're weak flyers, but they get extra distance by uh, climbing to a, to a high spot. Now this is the, the grape. Now when this video starts, you'll be able to see several individuals ejecting honeydew, and that's where a lot of the, the problem comes in. Uh, up in here, you'll see uh, streams of honeydew dropping from a, an insect that's out, out of view. There, you start to see this, these droplets coming, coming out. This one here, uh, up here, will be eject you see the, the streams of honeydew being forcibly ejected. This all ends up down the ground. The ground will be soaked with honeydew, uh, as well as anything else that's under the plant, uh, and becoming sticky and shiny uh, before it develops a sooty mold that will grow. And then you'll see a, a stream arcing up in, in this area from another individual. So they're pulling out large amounts of phloem sap, which results in weakening of the tree and dieback. Here we see the stream of honeydew shooting out. 
And this large amounts of honeydew has produced a quality of life issue for people living in the uh, infested areas, people not wanting the kids to go out and play in the yard. And here we see in a yard, the, um, this is a, a black cherry tree, the thousands of individuals here. Uh, we talked about them uh, uh, aggregating on vehicles. Here you will see one on a small vehicle with the adults uh, gathering on here. But you see the plants around here become shiny from the, the sooty mold, from the, the honeydew and then turning black gradually because of the honeydew production. This is a, a steps onto a, some, uh, some people's deck with that sticky surface uh, over the steps and, and the deck. Now, prospects for biological control. Uh, there's been a parasitoid found in, in China that uh, provides fairly good levels of egg parasitization, up to 70% in one study, up to 90% in another. This is the parasitoid, what it, it looks like, uh, the anastatus species. And this attacks the eggs in the fall after they've been laid, and also in the spring before they've hatched. So two times of the year, they're attacking the, the uh, eggs. Uh, the evidence for parasitization, um, when the parasitoids come out, it, you know, there's a large round hole uh, left on the, on the eggs, as opposed to the emergence when the landrinflies have come out, more sort of a slit-like appearance, sometimes with an egg cap ha hanging out. Now, the, the, the parasites have a behavior that increases the impacts beyond what you would simply expect from, from uh, egg laying. Uh, just like uh, in carcida, the, the parasitoid that can be imported for us and sold for white fly production, they, uh, they, you know, they, kill, they kill the eggs they lay their eggs in, but the female will also pierce some eggs with her ovipositor and then turn around and feed on the, the blood that oozes from the wound. That also kills the eggs. So the impact goes above what uh, you would expect simply from egg laying. Uh, bird predation, you know, there, there's a range of birds. These are old world, world birds, you know, uh, bulbuls and tits. These are like our chickadees, but these have been reported to feed on spotted lanternfly, but the uh, birds usually vomit after feeding. The, the, the lanternflies acquire uh, alkaloids from Tree of Heaven that give them uh, a bad taste and uh, um, a vomit response to the predators. In Pennsylvania, they've been looking for parasitoids and the natural enemies. This was an interesting parasitoid that was found. This is polypagus, but normally polypagus on Lepidoptera. This was the first non-moth species that has been reported for this parasitoid. Unfortunately, it didn't show up again in sampling this year. Uh, what we've seen in Pennsylvania and in Virginia, uh, uh, predatory hemipter, oh, I'm sorry, um, uh, in Pennsylvania, we, we don't have uh, information yet in, in Virginia, predatory hemipterans like wheel bug feeding on it. Also, uh, mantids. This, uh, this is a former tech student that lives up in Pennsylvania now. She sent this photograph of a praying mantis feeding on it. These are generalist predators and not likely to be putting much of a dent in the population. Prospects for chemical control. Early work in Korea after it invaded there in the, the early the mid 2000s, uh, the pyrethroids were, were highly effective. Keep that in mind when I look at preliminary data from Pennsylvania. Organophosphates were effective. The the neonicotinoids, you know, variable. Some highly effective, some less so. But in uh, in Pennsylvania, some uh, uh, preliminary work done by a graduate student there. Uh, the neonicotinoids were generally very effective, uh, some of them moderately so. The pyrethroids and, and carbamates, very effective. You know, the yellow ones are, are excellent, as you see in the bottom. The pyrethroids, moderately effective at best. And so uh, th that needs to be confirmed. You know, uh, that's in contrast to the results that were found in South Korea. The neem ne materials were, mo were moderately effective, probably against the, the nymphs. And uh, insecticidal soap was uh, very effective, probably against the nymphs as well. This is all based on very preliminary work done in, in Pennsylvania and, and needs to be confirmed. Mechanical control. In China, uh, there was a, an article that showed that uh, removing of eggs by wire brushes and gloves were uh, the most effective, but you have to look at the date. This was in 1946, before there were uh, many synthetic insecticides. However, mechanical control is an important part of the eradication program using the tree banding 
as you saw the yellow uh, the the brown bands and this works well because of the behavior I mentioned where the nymphs fall uh, frequently out of the trees and have to crawl back up this is why they get caught on the on the banding and the the, uh, the surveys in Pennsylvania and the checking of the survey have shown that the citizens doing this have a very high uh, accuracy rate in identifying the insects that show up on these sticky bands because they're so characteristic. There's not much you can confuse with these spot and lantern flies. Uh, so using the, the banding to, to get, get the adults as they're falling and ascending again and then destruction of, of egg masses. Uh, here we have the, uh, the fact sheet that we, we've created. There's also a USDA fact sheet in Spanish. Uh, if you uh, if you have uh, workers that you want to have uh, access to the information, this is linked in the Virginia Fruit web page, and this is the um, the uh, ad uh, address for the reporting portal. That's uh, there's also a simpler redirect now, as, as Eric pointed out. But we really want to get the, uh, this link out to uh, the public so that they can have access to re reporting what they find. So sample now, looking for eggs. Uh, adults have been reported to be attractive to UV light, so you know, maybe black light traps would be useful in finding them for, uh, uh, for the first time in an, er in an area. So here's uh, the, the, the uh, email addresses for, uh, for uh, Eric Day and myself, and also the, uh, the, the link for reporting. And also I'll be putting out information on a, a blog that I have recently set up. And uh, so if you want to uh, gain, gain access to this blog, then um, you'll see information as I post it there too.